If you have a Bible, go ahead and open it to Ephesians chapter 6, and we are finishing the book of Ephesians today. Um, while you're finding the book of Ephesians, um, I want to remind you we're starting the book of Genesis next week. Now, Genesis has 50 chapters. It's going to take us the rest of the year to go through it. At our church, we generally just go through books of the Bible uh, verse by verse, and so it's going to take us the rest of the year, and what we need from you each week, you're going to have a little bit of a reading assignment, not a lot, but a little bit. Um, so that Jeremy and I and the other pastors don't get up here and read every single verse in those long chapters of narrative in Genesis. We're going to ask you to read ahead. So this coming week, try to read Genesis 1 at least one time. Um, You can read it in one sitting. It's not a long uh, reading assignment, but if you could read it multiple times, that'd be even better. So study that, read it this week, and then uh, then we'll go through it as a church uh, next Sunday as we begin the book of Genesis. Now today we're finishing... Uh, chapter 6 of Ephesians, and at the end of this letter, uh, Paul mentions one of his closest friends. And so the topic of today's sermon is really about friendship. And um, and I I think it's it's probably more important than ever to have friends around us. Um, We went, uh, uh, we we took our youth group to Kings Island a while back, um, and we went, I hate haunted houses and stuff. It's just the worst. Um, I get terrified at that stuff. Like, I know it's fake, and I tell myself it's fake, but I still get really scared. And probably the only person who was more scared than me at, at the haunted Kings Island was Zoe Westfall, one of our teenagers. And she was just, I mean, she was very vocal and very loud, which makes all the monsters come toward you. And so what she needed in that moment were, were friends to hide behind. And I, I became a good friend for her. She could completely hide behind me, right? And, um, and so then they're all coming after me because of Zoe. And, um, and, and so we, we need friends in our lives that can back us up when we're scared or when we're not doing well or when we need help or when we need care or assistance. And, um, and I think the Bible makes it clear that we need those things in our life. Um, there was a, a study that was recently done, I read about recently, um, that, that, that showed that it was a study of happiness, lifelong happiness, um, the ebbs and flows of happiness throughout your life. And it, the conclusion was, overwhelmingly, the biggest factor of happiness in your life are your friendships, are your relationships that you have with other people. Of course, with your kids, with your family, with your spouse, but, but even those um, who are around you who are not related to you, the, the study showed that overwhelmingly that was the biggest factor that determined whether you were a happy person or not. Um, and so scientifically, the largest factor of happiness being relationships, that means that, that we need that in our lives. It shows us, it teaches us something about how God wired us, how he created us to be. Now we find ourselves in a modern era, though, where more and more of us know that we need those relationships, yet we seek to fill those relationships digitally rather than personally. Um, Not necessarily anything wrong with that, but I think there's something that's just inherently lacking through a screen of your phone rather than real interpersonal relationships. And so when we think that that's a, a valid substitute, it should be no surprise to us that rates of anxiety, depression, loneliness in our society are higher than they have ever been in human history. And so when we see that as the case, I think the church has the answer. I think the church has the answer, and it's found in the community that the Bible calls us into. Um, Let me read the text of Ephesians chapter 6, just the last four verses, verses 21 through 24. Um, Paul writes, So that you also may know how I am and what I am doing, Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will tell you everything. I have sent him to you for this very purpose that you may know how we are, and that he may encourage your hearts. Peace be to the brothers, and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. I have two things I want you to see in this text, just two simple points. Number one is that you need friendship in your life. I want to call you to that. I want to call you to pray for that and find that if you're lacking it. The second thing I want you to see is that others need your friendship in an act of mission. This final section of Ephesians, we see that we're called to be on mission together with God. And so as I call you to friendship today, I I want you to see that God is actually calling you to be friendly for the sake of the gospel, for something that lasts longer than any earthly friendship. It lasts eternally. Um, And so point one, you need friendship. 
friendship. I wrote a blog this week, if you guys are interested in checking that out. It's a short um, article about friendship and how it, it is actually a very tangible grace that God gives to us. Um, my wife likes to, to poke fun of me um, and make fun of me for a lot of reasons. Um, but one of the reasons that she likes to make fun of me is my friendships, or as she would say, my lack of friendships. She accuses all my friends of not being my real friends. And I say, that's not true. They're really my friends. And I'll be like, Jeremy, see, aren't, aren't we friends? Tell my wife. She's doubting. He's like, yeah, we're, we're work friends. It's great. And um, <laughs> she's like, well, all your friends are just activity-based. You have poker friends, you have biker friends, you have fishing friends, you have pastor friends. Everyone fills some kind of category and activity. So for me, obviously, doing stuff together is a big component of friendship, right? Um, for Amanda, her best friends are, are people that don't want to do anything with her, right? <laughs> she's like, you're, you're the best friend to me when you don't want to spend time with me, because she's, she's introverted like that. And so you may be like me, and you really want your friendships to be based around doing things together, or you may be more like Amanda and have a small amount of deep friendships that are more communication focused, uh, b- perhaps. But um, I think Amanda's a little bit more like Jesus. And so you introverts in the room that think I'm just going to make you be friends with everyone. Um, take a deep breath. It's okay. You don't have to panic because Jesus was a lot like my introverted wife. Um, Jesus had a small amount of deep friendships. Um, Jesus had 12 disciples one of whom betrayed him, so wasn't really a friend at all. Um, he, so he had 11 real friends. And even among those 11, he had a, what's called the inner circle of the disciples, uh, Peter, James, and John, the, these three that he brought um, in a little bit closer into his relationship. Um, now, Paul was the opposite when it comes to Paul's friendships, opposite of Jesus. Uh, Paul was a little bit more like me. He had lots of friends uh, all over the place. Paul wrote Ephesians. Um, And as we look at this letter, he's writing a letter, I believe, to some of his closest friends. Paul spent more time in the city of Ephesus in ministry than he did anywhere else during his ministry. Um, And so he's writing this letter from house arrest in Rome. And as he writes, he is truly writing to his friends. And I think it's evidenced by the way that we get to the end of the letter. And he says, I just want to, I want to send this messenger um, the purpose of the letter is doctrinal and, and application focused, not, not necessarily personally focused, but he says he's sending someone because he says, I want you to just know how I'm doing. I want, I want you to be encouraged. Um, I believe he's reaching out to his friends. In other letters, Paul shouts out his friends. Actually, in Romans 16, if you want to check out that chapter at some point, uh, the genre I would give Romans 16 is the genre of shout out. It's literally just a full chapter of people's names um, that Paul uh, brings to brings attention to in ministry. And so Paul's got a lot of friends, and, and we see from last week's text, I want to read a few verses, uh, Paul's humility as he appeals to his friends. In verse 18, He calls them to be praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, he says, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. And also for me, that words may be given to me and opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. As I read this, I actually pick up a little bit, I don't know if you do, but I, I sense a little bit of fear in Paul's tone, that he knows the task that's before him is going to involve him having to have great courage and step into a place where he can boldly say things that he knows will um, perhaps get him killed, that eventually do get him killed. And so he asks his friends to pray for him. Um, Even the apostle Paul could not do life by himself. He very uh, truly felt a dependence upon his faithful friends. And in verse 21, he mentions a specific friend, uh, one of his most faithful ministry friends, although we don't know a ton about him. I want to give you some background on who this guy is. Um, He mentions this friend Tychicus in verse 21. He says, so that you also may know how I am and what I am doing, Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will tell you everything. Now, Tychicus was the carrier of the letter to the Ephesians. And so they didn't have USPS back in the day. They didn't have, Ephesus Church didn't have like a P.O. box that they went to. And so, um, so they had to find carriers who would, who would be trusted with carrying these letters, which they uh, perceived and understood were inspired scripture. This is a very important task that Tychicus was tasked with. Um, and, and this also means that Tychicus had accompanied Paul in prison in Rome. 
Um, he had gone to Paul. Now, Paul, um, as he's writing the prison epistles, is under house arrest, so he would have had to pay for his own house. He would have had to um, do that without income, and so presumably he had support from the church to be able to pay uh, for, a, for a, a place to live. It was probably very meager, um, and, and he would have been chained up, not, not allowed to leave his house. The groceries, you know, he had to have like Walmart delivery and all these things, and so he really did depend on his friends to just survive um, in the season that he's in. And Tychicus was, was one of those friends for Paul. Um, and, and Paul sends Tychicus to carry the letter. He writes an almost identical verse about Tychicus in Colossians 4. Verse 7 says, Tychicus will tell you all about my activities. He's a beloved brother and faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. What this means is Tychicus also carried the letter to Colossae. Um, which was a city in Asia as well. Uh, This also means that he probably carried the letter to Philemon, who lived in Colossae. And so Tychicus here is carrying three of of the New Testament scriptures. On two different occasions, Paul names this young man Tychicus as being available to be like an interim pastor for other ministers in the first century, namely for Timothy in Ephesus, as he calls Timothy to come and visit him in Rome, and for Titus in Crete, on the island of Crete. And so we know all of this to, to, to point to the fact that Tychicus was an incredibly faithful and loyal friend to Paul. And Tychicus um, was, we know from the book of Acts, that he was from Asia Minor, probably the city of Ephesus. So he's probably, as he's carrying the letter we're reading today in church, he's probably traveling back to his hometown. He, he traveled from Macedonia to Jerusalem. Uh, some scholars speculate he went to Corinth as well. All of this is just to show you that Tychicus was incredibly loyal. He was kind of like bad boys with Paul. Like we ride together, we die together, okay? And, and I want to just show you that and paint that picture for you so that you can begin right now in your mind to think of who your ride or dies are. Um, who, who do you have in your life that you can call on when you don't know what to do and you need advice? Who do you have in your life that you can call on when you need practical help, when you don't have grocery money, or when you need someone to drive you somewhere, or when you need help babysitting? Who do you have in your life um, that can go somewhere with you when you need someone to ride along? Or in Paul's case, who do you have that will visit you in prison? I hope that's not the case for you. Maybe for some of you rowdier members of New Heights, it might be who do you have that will go to prison with you, right? Um, End up in prison with you. (laughs) Wake up in a cell together. Well, some of you might be drawing some blanks here. And I want to draw attention to that, not to, not to point out loneliness in your heart or make you feel bad, but I want you to see a very real need that you have in your life. And, and I want to call you to very real proactive measures to find real, deep, lasting friendships in your life. And I promise you they're available to you. Now, everybody in the church doesn't have to be your bestie. Um, if, if we're all besties, it's, it's just going to be a nightmare for all of us, right? Some of us just are not compatible. We can be honest about that. We got some, not making eye contact, we got some crazy cousins in this family, okay? Um, so we don't have to be besties with each other, uh, but we do need to be friendly. And out of that uh, communal, corporate friendliness of our church, I believe we are supposed to find deep, lasting friendships as well. And so if, you, if you're lacking that, number one, you need to begin to pray for that. And secondly, maybe you need to be proactive in engaging people with that, knowing that you won't always strike gold with a a new bestie, but you need people, and you will find people if you look for them who will be friends who will be in your corner. You may be thinking, well, why do I need friendship? I've got my spouse, or I've got my parents, or I've got my kids, or I've got my family. Why do I need these friendships? Why are they so important? Well, several reasons Scripture gives us, I think. Um, One is our emotional health. Paul mentions in Romans 15, um, as he writes to the Christians in Rome, he says, So that by God's will I may come to you with uh, joy and be refreshed in your company. Just the refreshment of being in the company of friends is something that we need uh, for emotional health. Secondly, care. Uh, Philippians 4, Paul writes to his friends in Philippi, it was kind of you to share my trouble. You Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. And so he's saying um, friends can practically, very practically meet needs in your life. Um, benefits, not friends with benefits, that's something different, but the benefits of friends, okay? 
track with me. Don't lose me. Um, Hebrews chapter 10 shows us that community is needed. We're supposed to be in community with one another. It says, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. There's a very real culture of introversion that's becoming very popular, like we get uh, welcome mats that actually say, go away, um, right? <laughs> and we laugh at that, and it is funny, um, but, it, but that's not the Christian way. Um, and, and so if if you tend to be more introverted, and I know that you don't feel like peopling, as the youth say, um, but, but you should put an effort into gathering together. The Bible makes it clear that this is something we should prioritize, and I've found that even when I don't feel like peopling, the people that I people with uh, become a very real grace to me. And the last thing I want to show you is that it's just for fun. Um, as a practical means of grace in a fallen and depraved and very sad world, uh, we get the grace of being able to just have fun together. Ecclesiastes chapter 8, uh, the preacher says, I commend joy for man has nothing better under the sun but to eat and drink and be joyful, for this will go with him in his toil through the days of his life that God has given him under the sun. So scripture is clear that friends are a source of health and joy and fun, and it is a way that God loves you by putting good people in your life. Proverbs 17 tells us a friend loves at all times and a brother is born for adversity. This means that as a brother will fight alongside you and blood is thicker than water, a friend should do the same thing. A friend will come alongside you and stick with you and be loyal to you. You need people like this in your life. And so for Paul, he had lots of people like that. People like Tychicus, Crescens, Titus, Luke, Timothy, so on and so forth. Um, but I want to paint a picture of kind of a, a disheartening ending of, of Paul's life. Not in a gospel sense, but in a personal sense. Um, at the end of Paul's life, he finishes, let me just paint a picture. He finishes his um, home confinement period in Rome. That lasted two years, and he lived in a, a furnished home that was provided presumably by the church. And he's probably chained up to the wall or something. And there's a, there's a guard, a parole officer that checks in with him. Um, after two years of that, he's released, and he travels again, continues ministry for a few years. Um, re he returns to Rome and, and meets face-to-face, uh, -face, probably on trial with Nero, probably the first fulfillment of the Antichrist prophecies in uh, Revelation and John's epistles. And Nero um, most likely imprisons Paul, not under house arrest, but in a cold and dark pit. Don't think of a jail cell. Think of a hole. Um, and, and he's thrown into this pit, um, and here he writes a final letter to his friend Timothy. And in the final letter to Timothy, what we know is 2 Timothy, in chapter 4, the final chapter, the, we, we have recorded some of Paul's last words, his, probably his very last written words before he's executed. And what we see in this, I want to read this lengthier passage just to paint this picture for you, but what we see has happened is Tychicus... Crescens, Titus, and Mark, uh, all friends of his, had been sent out for ministry elsewhere. People who hadn't, who should have stuck with Paul, people like Demas, had abandoned Paul and, and even left the faith of Christianity. And you have this kind of sad picture of Paul at the end of his life with no one around him, except for one guy, Luke, a friend who sticks with him. And what Paul begins to do at the end of his life, it's interesting, he begins to call for people to come to him. And he says, it's, it's, it's useful for ministry that they come to me, not necessarily for evangelism or some kind of outreach program, but Paul understands that at the end of his life, he needs friends in his circle. He needs friends to come and be close to him. He writes in 2 Timothy 4 to Timothy, do your best to come to me soon. For Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Luke alone is with me. Get Mark, bring him with you, for he's very useful to me for ministry. Tychicus I have sent to Ephesus. We just talked about this. When you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas. This is just practically, he's cold in prison. Bring that coat for me. He says also the books. He doesn't have Netflix. He doesn't have, any, he doesn't have basketball hour in the prison at Rome. He says, can you bring the books so I can have something to read? And he says, and above all, the parchments, which is probably a reference to the Bible. He said, bring the parchments. I want to be able to read the Bible in my last days. 
And he's angry at some stuff that's happened. Verse 14, he continues, Alexander the coppersmith did me great harm. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. Beware of him yourself, for he strongly opposed our message. He says, at my first defense, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. May it not be charged against them. But the Lord stood by me and strengthened me, so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. So Paul says, I'll be rescued, not physically, but spiritually. Spiritually, I will be brought safely into the presence of Jesus, though they will cut off my head. His sentence had likely already been handed down to him, and he was, in fact, beheaded. He says, Jesus himself will usher me safely to his side. Even in the midst of that great promise, Paul said, Timothy, can you come be with me? Can you bring Mark with me? Mark's a guy that he previously had beef with. See, even at, with the greatest promise of eternal life, Paul said, I need my friends with me. He felt loneliness. And surely it's easier to be a homebody, to not people all the time, right? But the effort of friendship is worth it. And so hear me clearly when I tell you, you need friends in your life. The second thing I need you to see is that others need your friendship. You might feel like you don't need them, but maybe, maybe they need you. The reality is you may feel like you don't have the time, margin, energy, capacity to be friends with everyone. Let me just give you this grace. You don't have to be, and thank God for that, right? There's some people I'll be friendly with I just don't want to be friends with, all right? Not any of y'all, of course. Um, just the people watching online. <laughs> kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> kidding. Um, but... But we are called to be friendly with everyone, but we, we don't, we, we're not going to have the capacity to be friends with everyone. But, but as God sovereignly works through circumstances, you will have new friends that come into your life that you, frankly, did not expect. And God will sovereignly orchestrate it so that you can be an act of grace to them if they're Christians, and you can be the gospel brought to them if they're not Christians. And, and so in verse 22, Paul says, he's sending Tychicus he says, I've sent Tychicus to you, Ephesians, for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. A lot of them, um, had, the church had grown. Tychicus had traveled for years with Paul. A lot of them probably didn't even know him. And he's reintroducing Tychicus to his hometown and saying, you need to know this guy. He's going to encourage your hearts. He's going to stir your heart up to love. And so Paul in prison, he's going to fill them in on how he's doing so they would be encouraged. And, and Paul probably senses his release. Remember, he's not in the pit right now as he's writing Ephesians. He's in the home confinement. He probably senses he's going to be released. And, and as he sends Tychicus with the letter, he closes the letter with this magnificent ending in these two verses, um, which center on the theme of love. And so what is Tychicus going to encourage their hearts to do? To stir them up to love other people, to be friendly. Paul says, peace be to the brothers and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. And in this final conclusion in doxology, Paul focuses on love as he mentions love three times. Now, it's all translated love in English. There's, there's two different Greek words that are used. The first two occasions of love, one in verse 23, and the first translation of love in verse 24 is agape, which is the most common word for love in Scripture. It means, uh, most simply, unconditional love. It's a loyal love, that, that you won't do anything wrong to lose that love. But the last one, in the English Standard Version, which I usually preach from, um, the last one is translated into English in two words, love and corruptible. Uh, the Greek word is aptharsia, which, which means love that never decreases. Um, if you're like the Bashams, sometimes you buy bananas and bread so you can watch them rot on your counter and grow mold. Um, the, 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 the word picture that's built into aptharsia is the opposite of rotting fruit and food. In the same way that bananas and bread expire quickly, some people's love expires quickly. Some of it's situational. Some of it is selfishly motivated. You might have had people in your life who very much seemed to love and care about you, but once the benefits were gone for them, they deuced out and took off. 
And so Paul here is admonishing them to unconditional love, but then at the end specifically, um, atharsia, which is love that does not expire. It's better than the expiring and diminishing love. This is like the Vienna sausages of love. It never expires. I've got cans of Vienna sausages that if I go camping next week, I'll grab them out of the pantry. They might be more than a decade old. They're still fine. They taste just as bad as they ever have, and that's what they're designed to be. And this, you know, Vienna sausage love is better than banana love because it is long-lasting. It is not diminishing. It is not expiring. That even though it might not have the flash and pizzazz, it sticks around and it's loyal. It's the kind of love that Jesus admonishes his disciples to in John chapter 15. He says, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. And so Jesus positions himself as the ultimate friend, right? He teaches us friendship. He teaches us love. He teaches us how to love. And he says, uh, fulfill this commandment by loving one another in the same way that I have loved you. And so he says, your love does not expire. Rather, as an act of your love, you are willing to expire yourself to love people. You become expirable. You become expendable. You lay your life down for the sake of loving other people in a sacrificial way. That is the way that Christians ought to love. And when we show ourselves to be friendly to a world that desperately needs to understand what real friendship is, that they can't get it through a social media platform or on a screen, what they need to see are people who are willing to love them and lay their lives down in sacrifice to share hope with them. This is the kind of love we're called to. And I believe as we open ourselves up to to be friends of sinners, like Jesus' reputation, the Pharisees nicknamed him a friend of sinners, as we seek to be that, Christians, we model and emulate our greatest friend, Jesus Christ. And Paul sent Tychicus to Ephesus to encourage their hearts, to stir them up, to love incorruptible. So that they would love everyone. Now Paul Harvey, the rest of the story. We finish the book. I always got to give you the rest of the story. The rest of the story is a little sad. The rest of the story is that Ephesus forgot this. They forgot the final words of the letter that Paul sent them. Spurring them to love incorruptible. Rather their love did decrease. It did expire. And it was seen by a guy named John. The Apostle John, uh, we're talking about love, ironically was called the beloved disciple or the disciple whom Jesus loved. John was, I, I read a little bit on the history of the apostles this week, super fascinating. But John was most likely a teenager uh, when he ministered alongside Jesus. Peter would have been a middle-aged man and John is a young man. That's why he beat Peter when he ran to the tomb. Remember John concluded, and John outran him. A um, little humble brag in the Bible by John. Um, John's probably a teenager when he begins ministry with Jesus. And on the cross, as Jesus is dying, one of the things Jesus says from the cross is to John, he says, behold your mother. And he, and he says, mother, behold your son. And he commits his mom, Mary, into the care of John. John most likely uh, followed through on that promise and remained in Israel, probably Jerusalem, but, but at least in Israel with Mary, most likely until she died. And at which point she died, then John would have been freed up to travel in a missionary sense. John would have been one of the disciples that stayed around Israel longer than the other apostles, but where did he traditionally go first? Ephesus. Church history leads us to believe that John goes to Ephesus, and, and it's after all of the Ephesus we know. It's after Paul had planted and, and cried on the beach and left the elders and been to prison and wrote the letter to the Ephesians. All this had already happened, and then, and then John shows up. And I just wonder, like, what kind of church did John show up to find in Ephesus? Were they like, here's a connect card? Did they greet him well? You know, did they get him a t-shirt that was real soft that said church at Ephesus? And it's like... Oh, you, you knew Jesus? Okay, like, it's like, it make the connection there. Well, we know a little bit about it because 
After John goes to Ephesus, he gets in trouble with the law, as apostles did at that time. And he ends up being exiled to an island right off of the Ephesian coast called Patmos. And if you know a little bit of Bible history, you know that this island is where John received a revelation, and namely wrote the book of Revelation. Jesus appeared to John on this island, and in Revelation chapter 2, John writes to the church at Ephesus. And we have a picture, not just of what John's opinion was after his first time visit to the church at Ephesus, but what Jesus' opinion of this church is. And Jesus, speaking through John to the church at Ephesus in Revelation 2, says to the angel, which probably just means the pastor of the church in Ephesus, right? The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands, Jesus says to the Ephesians, I know your works, your toil, your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. And I want to linger on verse 3 for a little bit. Uh, Verse 3 says, I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. Jesus commends the church in Ephesus because of their holding on to strong doctrine. In the first century, all kinds of heretical groups and cults popped up. There were, there were people denying the Trinity, and the, and the saints at Ephesus said, hey, we have Ephesians chapter 1, which tells us God is Father, Son, and Spirit, and reveals the sovereign plan of God. The Trinity is real, and all of you who are denying that are heretics. They were able to defend that. There were uh, other sects popping up, and, and groups that were saying that to go to heaven, you had to keep the Old Testament law and, and, and fulfill all the Jewish commands. And the, the Ephesians were able to step up and say, hey, we have Ephesians chapter 2, which says that we're saved by grace alone through faith alone, and we're dead in our sins, but not by works of righteousness. We are brought to life by the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You don't have to work your way to heaven. There were apostles popping up and, and, and people claiming to be apostles who weren't really apostles. And they were saying, well, we've seen Jesus. And they were saying things like, you don't have to be a part of the church. You don't have to gather with people. And the Ephesians were saying, we have chapter 3, which says we are the body of Christ on earth, that we do unite and we do gather together. They were able to refute heresy after heresy after heresy, and Jesus commends them for that right doctrine that we see in their letter from Paul. But in verse 4, he says, But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. They got all the doctrine right. On the Bible exam, they got every question correct, but they abandoned their love. Their love expired. And Jesus says, remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. That's symbolic imagery of Jesus when he says, I'll remove your lampstand. He's saying, if you don't start loving like you did at first, you could have all the doctrine right in the world, but I will come and I will close your church down. The King James Version is is translated a little bit differently, probably incorrectly. It says that they had abandoned their first love, which leads many to speculate they had abandoned evangelism or abandoned some kind of church program. But a more accurate translation is that they abandoned love itself. The Ephesian church probably checked all the boxes on their list of church programs. They were doing outreach. They were doing Bible studies. They were doing discipleship. Their small groups were rocking it. Their Sunday mornings were cool. They probably had mediocre coffee and nice t-shirts. They had all of those things, but they had ceased to be loving and they weren't friendly anymore. And Jesus scolded them for it. Jesus commended their doctrine, but condemned their demeanor. And he took that seriously enough to say, if you don't fix this, I'm closing your church down. New Heights, let me tell you, this means that we can get all of those things right. And if we don't do it with love, we're not worthy of being a church anymore. We're not worthy of carrying the flag of the gospel if we don't do so in love. Ephesians is six chapters, three chapters of doctrine, three chapters of practical and loving application of that doctrine, and Ephesus forgot the whole second half of the letter. We don't know if they corrected the course. I'm an optimist, so when I read the Bible and history, I'm like, yeah, they fixed it. Jesus told them to. I'm sure they did. 
We don't know for sure. One thing that we do know historically is that Timothy, who was one of their pastors, um, died in a riot in Ephesus trying to save widows who were, who were under persecution. I, I mean, that, that, I think, shows some effort to return to the love that they had at first. We're going to protect the vulnerable. We're going to love the least of these. We're going to love the lost and the missing. And we're going to beckon them into right doctrine and belief. And so, church, I, I pray this is a calling to you to live in friendliness, to live in a way that you can be what Jesus was, a friend of sinners. Let us believe rightly. Let us be good apologists. Let us do all those things, but let us also love rightly in friendliness and in kindness, ultimately because we reflect the greatest love of all, Jesus stretching out his arms on a cross to take our sins on his shoulders, to die in our place and raise from the dead to save us. That's the message we carry. We cannot carry a message like that without loving hearts.